Oh, there's a lot of bush. I tell you, it's 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 <laughs> uncomfortable. It's it's uncomfortable. It's and it, uh, they don't have the funny thing is that they don't have hairy arms or legs, but it's but the moment they take the pants off, it just like springs out at you. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. so. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by Erwin Mitchell, the official legal partner of England Rugby. Erwin Mitchell are the safe pair of hands you need when it comes to protecting you, your family and your business. If you need legal advice and support, trust them to be there for you when it really matters. It's what Erwin Mitchell call the expert hand with the human touch. And you can find out more by visiting erwinmitchell.com. Hello and welcome to the Rugby Pass Offload with Ryan Wilson and Max Leif, and later on, we're in for a real treat, as we'll be joined by Wallabies legend and former captain Will Genia to discuss the Autumn Nations Cup and celebrate his incredible career so far. First things first, Rai Rai, a start, a bonus point win, revenge against the Italians, and you extend your unbeaten home record to nine games in a row. All in all, not a bad Friday night in Glasgow. Yeah, it was nice, and we absolutely pummeled them. I'll be honest, we should have probably put 50, 60 on them, like... It was, um, they weren't very good. They weren't very good. I won't take it away from us. Like, we played pretty well as well. But um, yeah, it was a shame to see Treviso. It was good. They had a few boys away, but so did we. And uh, some of the young boys showed up very well. So yeah, it was nice to get one back over on them. Um, old Franco Smith, he was a very happy man, as you can imagine, his old team. Pummel and them, 37-0. Um, yeah, it was all right. It was all right. Quick word on uh, Sione Vailan, who's a couple of meat pies for him. He looked, he looked pretty terrifying on debut. Maxi, you should have seen this. I don't know whether you did, but the big fella, 10 minutes in. Thankfully, it was 10 minutes in because he's a, he's a hefty fella, old Sione. Yeah. But he's, um, he's made a break. I reckon he's gone 65 metres. I'm not even joking, but he's got about... He's got about 30 metres out and the 10 is in the backfield and has come running thinking, oh, I'm chucking, chucking myself in the spokes here. And Sione's pumped the little fake. And the tens just thought, I'm taking that all day long. <laughs> so he's just run the other way, pretending he's bought the bought the dummy yeah. and the big fella's gone the full length. <laughs> just mad with it. Yeah, see you later. He was a wrecking ball of a man. Absolute wrecking ball of a oh, man. Man. When he's on, he's on. How do you make the break? Sneaky pick and go. Yeah, uh, standard A. Eh? Yeah, the old like he's like, look at he like lurches on the side, then that that big mitt goes back there. He's looking for the see if that A is looking out. Ta-ta for now, boys. And when he gets going, he's tough to stop, mate. He did me with a sneaky pick and go when we played Wasp once, yeah. Oh, I did he? Mate, I like got a hold of him just, but he's he's gone through and it, my fingers got caught in his shirt, pulled pulled these two little puppies straight out and he's gone through and scored. And I was just like, oh. I'll tell you. It'll take yeah, more than a hand to stop that, man. My yeah. God, yeah. On another note, though, I've got to mention this guy, Seb, Sebastian Cancellari, the Argentinian winger. He got man of the match. Boys, it's a crime that he's not involved with Argentina at the moment. I need We need to get Checker back on, and I need to have a word with him, a serious word, because this bloke is outstanding. Oh, he's one of the best players in the league at the moment. He was tearing it up. He's so good. Right, I was in the... Uh, I was travelling up to Northampton. We'll get to that, the actual game in a moment, but I was travelling up to Northampton and I was sitting next to... Sitting next to your mate, Magnus Bradbury, and uh, I did hear an interesting voice now, actually. <laughs> oh, 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 no, we're sure, we're sure. No, 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 leave it there, leave it there, leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's Come been on. a few. I'm just trying that, to work out which one. That is. tickled me. That tickled me. But yeah, Magnus Bradbury, very, very colourful, colourful human. Yeah. Interesting, interesting guy. He's um. It's a shame he's he's not involved with Scotland. I would have thought he would have had a look in. He's playing. He's going all right for you boys, isn't he? Oh, he's playing very well. He's playing really well. I'm I'm, I'm surprised as well. He's he's quality, mate. Loves the hard stuff. Loves it. Loves the yard after contact. That man, and he can he can hit. Yeah, I was quite surprised when he saw him not involved. I mean, it's a pretty Scotland have got a good back row, but you would have thought he'd get some sort of a look in. So, mm. but yeah, so. It, Back to me, I guess my 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 game, Mark. Is, that's what we're getting. <laughs> yeah, Max, you were involved in a ten try rugby feast against the Saints on Saturday, which sadly you ended up on the wrong side of. What did you guys take away from uh, from that visit to the Midlands? Oh, that first half, there was so we we will, we've gone seven points up in three minutes, just mauling and brawling, oh, yeah. and then twenty minutes of just Northampton Saints wide wide brand rugby, and Alex Mitchell getting weird. Um, yeah, we were down. 
pretty quick and it, it was just it was too much to come back to in the um, second half. But we, we, we gave a fair amount of ourselves then, but too little, too late. And it was just like, it was very disappointing. Such as rugby, though. Such as rugby, like, sort of the life we chose as sportsmen. Sort of bipolarism manifested. But yeah, dour, dour mood at this point. But it is, it is what it is, and you just have to bounce back and go again. Ain't that right, right? Yeah, that's right, man. And do you know what I tell everyone is we've had a few guests where we said, oh, come on here and, and have a chat. They, yeah, they're keen. And then something doesn't quite go their way. And guess what? They get to go, oh, I'm not going to come on this week because I'm going to let yeah. the dust settle. Guess what? We don't get we don't get that luxury, no. do we, Max? We have to come on every week and the dance to the music. Exactly. There are sins to the world. Mm, yeah, it was. Oh, man, yeah. But yeah, it's grim. But that's just that's just part of it. Isn't it? Part of the process, part of the growing. But that's it. That's why people love to hear our dulcet tones on, you know, where things mm. get wrong, don't they? Mark, don't you agree? <laughs> it's just funny because it's delivered with Ryan with a big smile, having come off a thumping victory, saying, oh, isn't it tough every week? And then, oh, that's, like, that's it. That's it in a, in a pretty, as a picture, that's the sort of, that's the dichotomy we experience. Yeah. We've had dark weeks, haven't we? Do you not remember when we got hosed by Leinster, 70 nil, and my coach got no, sick, yeah. and I had to come yeah. on here the week after, and you boys were laughing, yeah. and I'm, I'm like, whoa, a minute. don't, whoa, whoa, don't whoa, make whoa. jokes. Exactly. <laughs> there was a great article celebrating the success of the Dupriers brothers on Rugby Pass this week. Got us thinking, who are the most talented rugby families over the last 10, 20 years or so, with, it, with at least a couple of brothers playing professionally? If I could get your... Your top three. Well, you're not going to list all the ones that you've got. I can, I can go through and then so we've, we've managed to dig up some real, obviously the Dubrias, you've got the two Alagis, the Willises, the Curries, the Burns, the Josephs, the Piatals, the Vinopolas, Youngs, Greys, the Franks, the Barretts, Duplessis, Pieces, Brooks, Salveas, Ellers, uh, Lobes, Tipomis, Kearneys, Davies, uh, going even further back, the Bergamascos, uh, the Scottish legends, the Hastings, the Malaysian legends slash English, the Underwoods. We've got a lot. The Lamonts, the Evans. Good. Yes. Good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Sean Lamont, over 100 caps. The Evans brothers, probably the best looking, I reckon, out there. We could give them that. I mean, Tom's going out with Nicole Scherzig. He's absolutely laughing, isn't he? So. He has a pretty face, yeah. Holy hecka. Um so, yeah, we'll just give that one to them straight away, should we? The best looking. <laughs> okay, okay. Matt, seven, so, Tom Evans. Unbelievable rigs as well. So, okay, fine. So, Offload Chassis Award and Beauty Award goes to the Evans brothers. Congrats. Now for the talent Objectively award. the best. The objectively best brothers. Sh- oh, or should we do worst rig brothers next? <laughs> okay, worst rig brothers go. Johnny Gray is in there somewhere. Like, <laughs> is. Like the torso on that, oh, I love him. I love him, and then hopefully he doesn't listen. But oh my torso is that's what oh, boys call him. Sean Lamont, uh, Sean Maitland calls him torso. Doesn't even call him Johnny. Torso, come here. <laughs> torso. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> anyway, back to the actual rugby side of things. Boring. Uh, who are we going for? I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't even have the Dupree brothers in there, would you? With all the other legends in there. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you well, very much. sassy of you, right? <laughs> um, we go. With, I reckon the Franks, Franks and the Barretts. Obviously, they've won. They've got a fair bit of silverware between them, and they've yeah. got a fair few caps for a very, very dangerous team. Um, I think the two Alangis dynasty is just outstandingly freakish and scary. Like, look at the state of those monsters. Like, all of them at one point were just unplayable. Like, oh. ridiculous. We, for, we forgot a friend of the show from a couple of weeks ago, Armitage Brothers. Yes. Yes. The Armitage, they'd be in mind just because I was around them as a youngster and just, yeah, got to see them in their pomp. And they were both very good. Like, complete contrast. One, this kind of spindly six foot three fullback, the other, a sort of limpet of a of a ball at seven but they could both play like madmen they were outstanding surely there's something about particularly brothers where it's like a quite a significantly different skill set and they still both manage to be absolute guns at it mate yeah again you're right the Vunapola brothers oh yeah Billy and Marco Billy, outstanding Bill could probably do a stint in the front row though as well couldn't he 
Yeah, he probably could get it done if he had to. Like if he if he really put his mind to it, he could have he could have been an outstanding front row. And Mako plays; he's got hands like a like a bat. And Mako's, so. yeah, just got this mad set of skills. Yeah, the Youngs brothers. You're right. A hooker and a nine. Yeah, but uh, Tom started for centre at champ level. To be fair to him, yes. yeah. Uh, so who who are we what are we doing? We're picking three of these guys, are we? For me, it's the Franks, Barretts, and the two Alangis. But maybe we're getting boring by putting two sets of all blacks brothers in. Maybe we like zoost well, it up. Yeah, let's we'll keep the Barretts in because we've got them. we've got a lock forward and then we've got two bags. We've got the two Alangis who are basically absolute boogeymen all over like club rugby all over the world. Yeah, we've got nine of them that are playing. Um and then yeah, who's who's your third? You could just do three Savaya. The three the Savaya's. I mean, they're they're a different gravy, aren't they? You could just have three all black ones. That'd be that's ridiculous. Savaya. Right. Okay. So we are finalised with. Let's go. Two Alagis done. The Barretts. Yes. Particularly with the dad with that line. Did you hear what he said? I'm going. I'm going off to go make some all blacks. And he did. Oof, I like that. That's good for him. Franks or Youngs, or Vunipola, or the, yeah. I'll go Vunipola. Yeah, Vunipola's and Youngs in there. They are four. Done. All right, boys, let's get your best combined 15 for the Northern versus Southern Hemisphere using current players. Okay, so we're going to go with the mighty Ox Nisha, loose head. I can't wait to see him. Then we've got Sam Takiaho, the hooker, the All Blacks, absolute highlight reel. Then Franz Malho, I'm pretty sure he's touring. A set-piece specialist, ginormous linchpin for that Springbok pack. Ebenezer Beth, the goat lock. And then I've got a newbie, a, the young rookie Derns of the Brave Blossoms. Very promising youngster. Look the business. And then we've got Crema, the Argentinian six. Terrifying man, great facial hair. And then... Jimeno, the Bray Blossoms seven, looking rambunctious and industrious in their game against the All Blacks. And then, of course, none other than Ardi Severa at eight. The best mate from Australia at nine, Nick White. There you are. No good. rugby nonsense about it. Just good bloke. Bloody good bloke. Bowden Barrett at 10. You've got to have him in there. Paisami at 12. Love the bloke. Creel at 13 to have another Saffir in there. And then our back line, holy hecker, uh, the back three. I've got so many back three written in there, but I'm going to go Will Jordan. Absolutely love the bloke. Can't not have Colby in there. Chosen and Colby. And then Matsushima to have a, a brave blossom in there like Max, because Max put loads in his team. I better have one in there. So Matsushima, happy days. There you have it. Okay, boys, now for your Northern Hemisphere picks, please. A front row of Ty Furlong. Uh, Genge and Marchand. Yeah. Solid I'm front row, Max, don't you think? Absolutely. Good scrummage in front row. Yeah. We love scrum. Scrum, scrum, scrum. All up scrum. the park as well. Um, I'm, you've got to have Ty Byrne in there. I think he's outstanding yeah, at the moment. And you've got a Toje, James Ryan and Willemster. Uh, I'm going to sh- I'm going to throw some absolute size in there. I'm going to chuck Willemster in there. And back row, Hamish Watson at seven. Aldrit at eight. Good. And it's six. I'll throw an olive on. Newton of a man. There we are. That's a good pack, that. Give me a back line. Right, at nine, we have Antoine Dupont. Obviously, goes without saying. Then at ten, we put the old man who's fighting father time for the men of green. Johnny Sexton. Oh, you should have put Finn Russell in. Just I knew, I knew you wanted Finn <laughs> Russell. That's why I picked yeah. Johnny Sexton. <laughs> all, all Finn, Finn Russell. Russell's not available, mate. He's not in the squad. Anyway. Very yeah. true. Very true. 11, Damien Benor. Disgusting player. Then we've got Scotland's very own 12. See, only two, Tui Pelosio. Very busy. Very busy. Then I'm going to go weird. Thunder and thunder in the centres. I've got Manu Tuolangi. Oh, mate, those two in the centres. And can't... then this back three is not getting any ball, but it's fine. Then Reese Samit, he's on, he's on fire at the moment, gentlemen. The Prem, the, the, that, that, he's flying for Gloucester. Outstanding player. And then, of course, the tower 
of absolute faith at the back, Freddie Stewart. Yeah, we love him. We love him. What a guy. All right, so boys, bright and early, first thing in the morning for our time with Will Genia. Can't bloody wait, mate. Can't bloody wait, mate. Really looking forward to it. Get amongst it with the big fella. See ya. See you later. See you then, boys. We are up at some horrible, horrible hour. It's only seven (laughs) o'clock. Yeah, let's just calm right down there. Yeah, I I mean, it's only 7am. It's it's not actually that bad, is it? We are delighted, though, to be joined by Will Genia to have a look ahead at the Autumn Nations Cup action from uh, what's coming up, what's happened, and also celebrate his uh, incredible career achievements to date. Uh, firstly, Will, hello, you're out in Japan. How, how are things going? Mate, I'm well, thank you. I'm actually in, in Australia. We've got a couple of weeks off, so uh, I'm oh. back home in Brisbane at the moment. So how are things going anyway out in, uh, out in Japan, Will? Yeah, mate, things are good. Um, like, uh, the footy is what it is. I mean, it's at this stage of my footy career, like, it's, it's quite enjoyable. You know, you still get, this, like, stimulated enough to try and continue to improve and get better. It's not as, like, demanding as it is playing test footy or playing super rugby, but, like, you still enjoy the game. Were you uh, back in, in Brisbane or did you manage to witness firsthand that, that what's been described as a debacle of a performance by the All Blacks uh, on the weekend against the Cherry Blossoms? I, I did watch the, watch the game. I thought, um, I think they have a reputation, the All Blacks, have been quite rusty once they come off the back of a layoff and then they start to get into their work. But I think rather than talk about their performance being poor, I thought Japan were excellent. I think it's, that it really showed how far the game's grown in Japan in the sense that while they're not maybe the, may the biggest team and maybe as physical as the Southern Hemisphere or Northern Hemisphere teams, you know, the, the traditional powers, they play with, you know, a high level of speed and skill. And from, from all reports from having spoken to some of the Japanese players, you know, they, they get work into the ground in terms of conditioning because they understand that has to be a point of difference for them where they're just as fit or fitter than all the other teams and try to run them off their feet. Is there an element of that actually in the league as well? Yeah, I'm certainly. I mean, so we I've been playing in Division 2 for the last three years. So we've only just recently been promoted to Division 1. But, you know, when you sit back and watch a lot of the, the Division 1 teams play against each other, yeah, there's a, it's, it's very fast paced and there's a level of a high level of skill. Um, and, it, like, you watch the scrums and the moors and the, the teams that tend to do really well in that space are the teams with a lot of the foreign players. But if you look in the general play, like, it's, it's the Japanese players as much as anyone else that are playing with the high level of skill and speed and, um, have a lot of running, so it, it's it's no secret as to why it's translated over into their into their national setup. Is it Kintetsu? Is it the Kintetsu liners you're at? Is that where you are? Yeah, mate, Kintetsu and Osaka. Um, oh, is that in Osaka? Is it? Yeah. Oh, I like Osaka. That's that's a good spot, actually. You've you've done all right there with that spot. Mate, it's a great spot. It's it's to, to, Tokyo is obviously a, a beautiful place, but it's a bit too big and a bit busy. Whereas Osaka is a little bit more laid back, a little bit spaced out. Um, good food, good people. I think Japanese on the whole has just been a, a, a beautiful experience for me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I loved it over there. I absolutely loved it, except for the rugby. I absolutely loved it. That World Cup that we, uh, yeah, we, so did, we, did you, we did you did did you enjoy the World Cup over the over, over there? Like the experience really? of it all. Genuinely, I absolutely loved it. I've, I've been lucky. I've managed to tour Japan three times. I did it with Vern Cotter. We played the three test series. I did it under 20s World Cup, but then I really enjoyed the World Cup. I thought it was incredible, like what they did over there. And I witnessed firsthand how good the Japanese have got at rugby um, when they knocked us out of the World Cup. <laughs> Look at me laughing about yeah. it. Yeah. Honestly, Mate, like, so- one of the most, it was a brilliant experience. Right up until we got hit by that. Um, was there a hurricane or something? I think yeah, it was a hurricane. Typhoon, yeah. yeah, the typhoon. We had all those warnings around bloody um, potentially getting flooded. We had, we had earthquakes where we were staying as well. Like we had tremors when we were staying in Ottawa, I think it was. So it was very different in that, in that regard. We've had like tremors and stuff being in Japan. And I thought that I was suffering like concussion symptoms because <laughs> I could, everything was moving. And I, I, was, I, thought, I thought to myself, I need to go see the doctor here or something. Yeah, because, and, then, and then you... Yeah. And then you check social media and it's like, oh, there's tremors and things like that. So I was like, oh, thank goodness. I don't know which one's worse, but thank goodness. Another day, yeah. <laughs> right, just quickly on that World Cup. I know we, we've touched upon it before, but take yourself out of the, that Scotland team. Was it one of the like most incredible experiences that you've been a part of? Yeah, like I said, like the people, honestly, the people in Japan are 
it's so good, isn't it? I absolutely love them. They're the most amazing, respectable people, but also so good on the piss. They love it, don't they? Yeah. Is that why is that? Do you reckon? Is it because they're quite like a conservative, repressed culture in terms of that expression, and when they get on the beers, they get weird. Oh, I don't know. Will we? I, 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 I think. I think that's exactly what it is. Like it's, yeah. it, there's so much pressure on them to be normal and to fit in, and 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 being in a rugby environment in particular, it's like you can't you can't be normal. You've got to try to be yourself as much as you can, so that you can express yourself playing. And then when they get on the piss, my gosh, like they 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 like they get nude like pretty quickly. Uh, their, their face get all flush red, and they start wanting to kiss every bloke around, like and and, and dance and kiss blokes and things like that. It's it's. It gets pretty different, pretty. Uh, but then you see them the very next day; they're like suited up, ready to go to work, as if nothing happened. Yeah. Like, oh, hey. How's yes. it going? Oh. That makes sense. Yeah. Between that and like the people and um, oh, the onsens, mate, I could live there. Yeah, and the the onsens, <laughs> Sinclair. Sinclair to this day has been changed since that World Cup, mate. He's obsessed. He had to build it like an onsen in his garden. He's then like he's always in the sauna, but naked. No one else is because of the onsens. Oh, I'm telling you, how good are the onsens, Will? Mate, I'm not a fan. I don't, I don't like coming around <laughs> naked. Like other people just, yeah, with a towel. And so I don't make use of them. I'm always looking for a sauna around the place, but we, I can't find one. I very quickly realised that the um, the Japanese grooming isn't as uh, big as it is, is over here. They've um, they've got a lot of pubic hair over that way. I'll tell you that for sure. There's some serious <laughs> bush going on. Oh, there's a lot of bush. I tell you, it's 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 uncomfortable. It's it's uncomfortable. It's not, and it, uh, they don't have the funny thing is that they don't have hairy arms or legs. But it's but the moment they take the pants off, it just like springs out at you. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest here. And then the toilet. See, I mean, you never have to wipe your ass again. The toilet does everything for you, mate. I'm also not a fan of that. I don't <laughs> Are you joking? It's too, it's it's, too invasive. It's too un- <laughs> yeah, it's invasive. The water coming up there and it's like, I'd rather wipe and then maybe have a shower. No, nah, oh, nah. <laughs> I'm all over it. I'm all about getting naked with men, getting drunk with people that get naked and having water squirted up my arms. Irrigated <laughs> by high pressure water. <laughs> oh, oh, but yeah, it was, is, a great, that, it was a great World funny. Cup. It was a great World Cup, Mark. <laughs> CD, CD World Cup. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, let's let's go to some rugby a little bit. And uh, former All Black uh, Jamie Joseph said that teams no longer fear the All Blacks. Perhaps a bit. It's hard to disagree with that s- statement. Surely all the home nations are going to be licking their lips at, at taking an All Black scalp at some point over the Autumn Nations. What do we all think? I just think don't have the reputation that they've had in in years gone by where like a lot of the times when you lined up against the All Blacks you, you were essentially coming up against a reputation beforehand and then having to play them on the field and whereas the team probably hasn't been successful as successful as, as it has been with the players like your Dan Carter's your Richie McCoy your Martin Onus, those types of players and I think it's also just it speaks to the volume as far as teams are just getting better around the world like you saw Ireland go there and win a series for the first time ever you know, as someone who's played against the All Blacks for 10 years straight, I never won a game in New Zealand. So you, you just see that the other teams are catching up and getting better and better. And it's it's still the most prized scalp that you can take. So teams are licking their lips. So from your perspective, Will, do you, do you think this is the worst All Black side that you've seen in, in your playing career? I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say it's the worst All Black side I've seen in my <laughs> career. I, I still think they're a very... I, I think that... So to be honest, I think they're actually building quite nicely towards the World Cup. I think they're still trying to figure out their combinations. You've got Jordy Barrett who could potentially play 12 for them. Um, they're still trying to figure out, figure out and fully, I guess, um, figure out who's going to play 10 and potentially 15 because they've got Will Jordan who can also play 15 for them as well. So I, still, I feel like they're still figuring things out and they're building quite nicely. But I just think in, within that process, they're probably not having the success not only that they're used to, but we're, we're used to, you know, people who are watching the game, having had expectations of them always winning and doing well. So there's a lot of public pressure that, that, that comes with, I guess, their performances. And um, it was a pretty, pretty subtle dig, but pretty, pretty, pretty funny one as well from Jamie Joseph, I thought. Well, I mean, Max, you've, you've already said you thought it was the worst side. 
I've already said that. Answer. Yeah. No, I was I was thinking about how I should rephrase it. So I was like, the quality of the players is still like world class, but the team itself at this point isn't the best. But in saying that, Will raises a good point. The fact that the the sort of oppositions around the world now have also are also catching up, like a lot more rugby is being played and sort of prevent like if you look at the PI teams coming into the World Cup they're going to be ready to go as well now with Drew and stuff. So, and Moana. So it should be quite, quite interesting to see how everyone's going. Cause look at Japan, they're flying Argentina now, with, uh, Michael Checker at the helm. Um, it's all very, very tasty. Ryan, would you be confident if you were called up by Scotland to play them in a couple of weeks? I'd be more confident than I would have been in past years. Yeah. But you're still going up against some fucking unreal players. I mean, they're not, I'd say you you're going in expecting oh we could possibly win this more than you've ever done before but I mean you're not going in not not being afraid of them because they're still fucking unreal aren't they and they can still very quickly stick 50 on you so um yeah I wouldn't get ahead of yourselves I wouldn't get ahead of, ahead of yourselves yet we hey listen Scotland have got to do Fiji this weekend I'm looking forward to seeing those boys uh go over to Murrayfield I was uh I'm hopefully going to go and meet up with a couple of the boys today. I want to go see my old mate Penny Matawalu. So uh, let's let's wait for Fiji first before we see the uh, the All Blacks turn up to Murrayfield. You're so desperate for that call up from Fiji, aren't you? Know, just always it's you're literally their number one fan. I am. I am. I'm going to go and see Vern Cotter and see if I can uh, become team manager at some point. That's my uh, that's my dream. We've spoken about it plenty of times. No, that's not your. You couldn't do. You couldn't pull that off. That requires a man of incredible administration skills. Imagine, yeah. really you team. imagine the visa the visa issues. Oh my. Uh, um, boys, just a quick one on that Brody Retallick red card which I suppose uh, helped the Japanese a little bit. Ian Foster said it shouldn't have been a red. How did everyone see it? I'm with Fozzie. Uh, I'm going to have this. Yeah, I'm with Fozzie. I, I agree. I, I honestly, I feel like the game, as people adjudicating the game, have to understand that it's it's a high collision sport played at incredibly fast pace. There's going to be mistakes where sometimes it might, you, you, you get collisions that are dangerous, but there's no malicious intent and, and, Let's just say that's a yellow card to try and eradicate those things. But to change the complete outcome and context of a game by giving someone a red card over something like that, I'm, I don't agree with at all. Yeah, concur entirely. A hundred percent. And then if you, because we'll talk about the one in the Australia game in a minute, and that was only a yellow card compared to that, that was a red card. I'm, I'm still even dubious about the one in the Australia game on Tate McDermott. So I reckon there's no chance on earth that's a red card. Ruins the game. I mean, the other thing to say is what, what else could they do in that situation? Like, you've got someone get, getting low over the ball. How are you supposed to clean it? It's, it's almost like, oh, you can have the ball. Take it. That's essentially like what uh, – because what else are they supposed to do, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. There's nowhere else, there's literally nowhere else to hit him unless you come on an angle, which they're trying to stop people doing. Which they don't want because people keep blowing their knees out and stuff. So, and yeah, you can't, go through. You can't do the old crock roll. So, yeah, no, nah, stupid. The only way to solve it is take, uh, take Jacqueline out. And that ain't gonna happen, is it? And you don't want that either. Although well, that's what you that's what you hear on the great one. They're like sort of they want to get rid of that. And I was just like, well, imagine how many great players would just disappear if you got rid of Jack. Imagine Richie McCall. Well, he made a he made a living from it. And then you suddenly just go and nah, take that out. Yeah, again. I need him. Or George Smith. Or yeah, or like all those great. You almost just we well, almost just turn it into rugby league, right? You just go to the ground and get up and play them. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Just a quick one, though, on, on that. I'm, I know we've spoken about it before, but uh, the dump tackle after 2011, right, the uh, the Warburton red card, now you don't see it. So change can be positive, right? So how, unless if, if we're not trying to get rid of those dangerous moments, then how, how do we fix what's happening? Yeah, but the dangerous moments are exciting, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think you've got to put context to everything as well, though. Like, if, you, if you're talking a spear tackle, like, you're very much in control of a spear tackle. If you pick someone up and lift their leg and then point their head to the ground, yeah. there's very, you can very much measure the, the intent behind that. Whereas, But if you go into a clean out, again, it's a fast-paced game that's high collision, but, and you make decisions in split seconds. You, you, it's easy for the TMO to slow it down and be like, oh, yep, this ticks that box, that box, that box red card whereas it doesn't the game's not played in slow-mo on a big screen 
guys are having to make decisions. And it's hard to measure intent, but in situations like that, I feel like the referees have to trust themselves and make decisions based on how they're seeing it out there on the field. And like we've all played in many games, right, where that was a, a good clean out. You, you clean out, you get them off the ball. Uh, they're like the one with Tate McDermott against Scotland. And it just seems like we're going so far to the left now. And it's, it, for me, it, the TMO ruins the spectacle of the game, I think. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I think I think also, if they're doing this TMO stuff, I reckon the TMO just has this. If they want to keep the TMOs in and they go with the TMO, they just do it on the side and he just radios into the ref. Yeah, mate, that's a red card. Send him off. And you don't reshow it. You just get him off or do whatever the TMO says. But then be more lenient with it. I should be the TMO. Just sit in the box. Let loads of really reckless shit go but every now and then. Something really dangerous. Like, whoa, 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 no. Yeah. I completely agree with Will, though. Like, in terms of the breakdown, like, there's an infinite variation of different breakdowns happening. If you had a ref going, like, with a fine tooth comb over every breakdown in the game, there'd be so many illegal cleans by, oh, the, yeah. by the law. So, I just, you just got to have a bit more sort of like leniency with it, I think, because it's, it's just chaos. It is just organized chaos. Like, that's, that's sort of the brilliance of rugby in lots of respect, that sort of brutality. But, we can't be like completely sanitizing the sport because the reason that people are attracted to it is because of that sort of uh, physicality. Um, and that, that, that would be my two, 10 pence on it. Yeah. If you're a complete nutter, right? And you mm. go in for a jackal, you know that someone's coming to clear you out. So you do what you know you're have to do. about to get scrutinized in the worst kind of way. You just got to lift your head up and take one straight on the chin. Oof. Oh, oh, there we are. Red card. Happy days. You, you could just jackal, go around doing that the whole yeah. game. You're going into the belly of the beast there. That's what's about to happen. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Well, let's move on from TMO okay. VAR controversies. Um, New Zealand fans have been tweeting that they expect to lose all three of their fixtures against Wales, Scotland, and England. Oh. Is that is that ever possible? What I mean, what are your predictions, boys, for that? For those games? Wales, Scotland, and England. I think they I think they oh, I don't know. I reckon they beat Wales and Scotland, lose to England. I reckon they'll. Um, I reckon they'll beat England, lose to Wales and Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just, fuck you, Max. <laughs> people will realise there's not that much science behind your predictions now, guys. It's just whoever goes first. Yeah, Mystic Max, Mystic Max. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm gonna say they. I'm gonna say they win all three. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Fair enough. Right, let's go to the second match of the weekend, which had Brian Scotland side coming up against Will's Wallabies. Firstly, before we get into the match, Will, your reaction to Finn Russell being dropped from the squad? Man, I don't understand it. I love him as a player. I would have loved to have played with him. He, he reminds me a lot of Quay. You know, they, they've both got incredible skill sets. like they, And they're, they're silky movers around the field, have a great sense of anticipation, which I think all great players have. Um, and he's just someone who creates something from nothing. He, he makes something out of nothing and he has that ability where you throw him the ball, something's going to happen. And I personally don't understand it. Maybe there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes that we don't get, but I, I, I love him as a player. I would have loved to have had the opportunity to play with someone like him. I mean, in your career, Will, have you ever, you know, talking about Quaid or, or any other sort of mercurial number 10s where that maybe the coaches haven't got on as well with, but from the perspective of a player, you're like, we need him on the field. Well, mate, Quaid, when we played the British and Irish Lions in 2013, he was by far and away the best 10 in the country. Um, but he had, at that time, had a kind of fractured relationship with Robbie Deans. Um, and so, you know, Robbie obviously thought he was, in his mind, making the right decision by putting the team first to, to, to eliminate that, dist that distraction. He didn't pick him uh, and put James O'Connor at 10 for us. And, at that time, like James has obviously blossomed into a, a 10 now, but at that time he was a winner. And you know, he, he put him in a 10 to be able to play. And it's the one thing that I look back on in my career that I really regret is that series because having Quaid in that team would have made a huge difference to the outcome. I think. Well, he, at that time he was, you know, a world-class 10. Um, and yeah, he, he didn't get picked again because of that sort of fractured relationship at that time with Robbie. Can we see the other side a little bit you know if you are Robbie Deans or if you're if you're if you're Gregor Townsend 
Or is it from a player's perspective? Is it just simply he's our he's our best ten? Get him on the fucking field. Yeah, well, I think I think the big the biggest frustration for everyone was the with what Tooney came up with to say that it was his um it was his form and his consistency. I think it was, and he's been playing bloody well. I think that's what annoyed people the most, and the fact that which you've got to completely. I spoke about it last week the whole thing with Ross Thompson only playing twenty minutes, but it's got nothing to do with Ross Thompson. He he was. He could play because he was out. He was inside the Scotland window. This week will be a bit different. There'll be a lot of changes coming in because all the foreign players, all the the over, we say overseas people that play down in England, can actually play in this game. So there'll be a lot of changes there. But I think that's what pe- got people's backs up the most, wasn't it? Was the the excuses around why Finn wasn't picked? You can understand from a coach's perspective wanting to put the team's culture and team environment first. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I certainly get that side of it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, as a player, when I in, in that moment, thinking to myself like, we need this guy, you know, like he, he's going to make because particularly because the the last game I think the Lions played before they played us was the Queensland Reds at Ballymore, um, you know, and quite absolutely played the house down. And so having watched that and knowing that we weren't going to be able to have that in our side was was pretty tough to take. And like I said, looking back on it now, it's still one of those things that I regret. Uh, in my footy career. I think the likes of Blair King on, right? We'll get on to it. I think he played well. I thought he had a good game at 10. Other than that kick at the end, which everyone's, you know, tearing into him for. But listen, the guy, the problem is the guy doesn't kick for his club. He's, I think he's third on the list for his club. So you're putting him under a bit of pressure there. Um, But if you look at what's happening, I reckon you've got him stepping up at 10. He needs to get some more game time at 10. You've got uh, Six Nations of World Cup coming up. I reckon the the view is here. He, as brutal as it sounds, he's the perfect man to have on the bench because he's played at fifteen. He's a bloody good winger, and now he's covering ten. So he'd get a little bit more experience at ten international wise. Come a World Cup, you've got someone on the bench. You can go six two split. It covers every position. Finn slots back in. I mean, with Darcy Graham and Duhan van der Merwe on the wings, he's not really going to get a look in there. Oh, listen, you'll see Finn back in pretty soon. I know that for sure. Like, come Six Nations, I reckon you're going to see him back in. I just hope Finn doesn't take the huff and piss off to Japan. And then then it's too late. We'll take him. We're Quade's, Quade's out at the moment, so he can come join Kintetsu for a season. There you have it. There you have it. And Will gets the 15% agency fee. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> Well, you, you you must be a little bit worried about about the Wallabies at the moment, the sort of lowest ever ranking, <laughs> ninth in the world. Not that you always look at that, but Dave Rennie's win record only at thirty eight percent. Have you been a bit underwhelmed by his tenure? I think yeah, I have. Like, I can, I get sucked in in watching them play, and and I enjoy the way they play. I like the, the style of rugby that they're playing. They play with a lot of structure and detail, and it tends to suit the playing group. But then I get lost. I've been a bit lost until someone messaged, you know, t- told me about that um, the win record, and it, it is pretty, pretty disappointing, particularly because you want to start building consistency in performances, but also consistency in combinations. It seems like he's still searching for the right combination right throughout the team. You know, whether it's in the second row or the front row or the your nine and your ten, uh, your, your midfield partnerships. I mean, he hasn't been helped with certain injuries, but. It is a bit concerning that we haven't seemed to settle on key positions within the team moving forward because there's not that many games until the Rugby World Cup. And I think in my experience, particularly the last Rugby World Cup, you know, you look at at us then, you know, it was myself and Whitey who were chopping and changing throughout the, the, the whole competition. And it makes a big difference, not just with your performance as an individual, but particularly in those core, core spots, like guys respond to your voice and your direction. And if you're not settled in those particular areas, it makes a big difference to the functioning of the team. And so, yeah, it has been a little bit underwhelming, but um, hopefully they can use this tour as a springboard to sort of develop those combinations moving into, uh, into, into that Rugby World Cup next year. But there's still so many players out, so that's what I worry about. He can't get yeah, but, that consistency, can he? Yeah, problem- that's the thing. Like, you've got... You, you've got Quaid. For me, Quaid slots back in at number 10 as soon as he's yes. right because he's, he, was, he, he was excellent when he got back in there. Cool, and in, and he, fit, he, he, he very, yeah, and you've got Marika to come back. Uh, and those guys very much fit into the mold of how Dave wants to play. So those guys coming back will add that boost of experience and quality of player. Um, but like I said, I, I just hope that like we start to settle on combinations moving forward. Um, you know, hopefully guys who are playing now can, can, can step up and take those opportunities. 
But don't you find that Australia, especially with its um, player base being quite small, and a lot of the best players aren't even playing in Australia, and that sort of ties Dave Rennie's hands. Do you know what I mean? Like we got like people like Jordy Reed over here pinning up trees. You got Sean McMahon in Japan being a freak show as always. Um, I'm just thinking like maybe I don't know. Shouldn't he just pick from everywhere and just get the best yeah. team he can? I feel like that's not the best one of these team that can be picked. No, but he's not allowed, is he? Is he? Is uh, are you only allowed three or four from overseas at the moment? Yeah, we're only allowed three, so you can get three overseas players. And but but I'm with you. Like I, I honestly believe that you should have available wherever they are. Yeah. But I guess the argument to that is it probably it takes away from the quality of the competition here with Super Rugby, uh, because yeah. you, if if everybody can leave and cash in and make make money, they will. But then what people don't realize, I think, powers of bees. All these big clubs overseas, it's not like they're going to say, oh, we can pick all these Australians. Let's go pay them a, a shitload of money now. They're not going to do that. They're only going to pay the top level quality of players. So you're not, the, the, you, they're not going to take all the talent. They're only going to take the sprinkling at the very top. And even then, they, they might not. So I'd love for them to just open it up and say, look, let's just pick yeah. from everywhere. Just pick from everywhere. Imagine it'd be a cl- oh, it'd be, it'd be, Yeah, it'd be so class. People like Tate McDonough, I thought played fucking well at the weekend. He showed up pretty well. I would have Pete Samu starting. I, like the man comes off the bench and absolutely tears it up every time. Big pistol. Every, every time. Right, I'm with you. I, I, I don't know how. Like I think he hurt his back. or But even before he hurt his back, he was relegated to the bench. Man, he's been exceptional. I think every he's time. been excellent. Every time off the bench and even in the, the last couple of games where he started. And I like like my, Hooper's obviously world class, right? He's been one of the greatest players to play the game, I'd say. But like at the moment, the balance that the, the back row has and the forward pack has when you put someone like Pete Samu in is just he he changes the dynamic of that that forward pack because he brings size, he brings another a better option in the lineout, and he's just got his athletic ability and the carry and his work in defense is he's been excellent. Look, it's it's a interesting position to be in for Dave, you know, whether he makes that quarter to start picking Pete moving forward. Post-World Cup, well, I think I've read that you, you'd you quite like to see Michael Checker come back and uh, and take over. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, first of all, I think he's an excellent coach. Um, and the experience of that he's had in the five or six years that he had with the Wallabies and now with Argentina, he'll only become a better coach. But he just loves Australia. He loves the Wallabies. He just has like this crazy amount of passion and um, love for, for the game here in Australia and for, for the jersey and um, I love my time with him and so to be able to get another opportunity I think would I think I'd love to see it especially because he'd be coming back having learned the lessons from you know the years that he was already there at the Wallabies and now being in Argentina and, and all the other things that he's done we've had lots of your Wallabies teammates on here they've spoken about checks crazy alternative techniques if you will giving out shots of tequila pre-training he actually gave us his version on the pod a couple of weeks ago as well now what are your weirdest recollections of his alternative methods on and off the field i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but we so when we got um picked for the the rugby world cup you got told that you were going to make the the team and then we had we then had like he, he just sent you a message of where to go, like this secret warehouse or somewhere like, so I'm in Brisbane. He was like, go this to this place at this time. Um, and then I, you go there, it's dark, it's pitch black, it's black. There's no one there. It looks like you're going into like a CIA room or something. And then you go sit there and then you sit opposite this person with a computer screen in front of you, dark. And he just asks you all these random questions about, I, I can't even remember. And I, I felt like I was getting interviewed like I was a, terrorist or something do you know what I mean I was like I walked out of there thinking what the fuck just happened and then it, it came to be that it was just like he wanted to learn about the individual on a different level from away from sport so he could create bonds and connectivity around it and um, it, it was weird but like you actually realise the importance of it you know and, 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 and it did help us obviously we went to the, the final in 2015 um, but, that year so it but yeah, you've got all the stories around like the golf club and then you've got the, we would have like shots of tequila for someone's birthday or someone had a kid and then you'd, you'd, and he would make you drink it. And I don't like to do that stuff. And I'd be sitting there with the glass and he'd walk up and be like, mate, drink it. And I'd be like, fuck. <laughs> and, and down a shot and then skull some water and go out and he'd flog you on the training pitch. 
Yeah. Who, who was asking the questions then when you went to this place? Just a random bloke. Hey, this yeah. random bloke. This random bloke. And like everyone will have different experiences. I think my bloke had like a like a veil on or something, all in black. And it was a ring red. Dude, it yeah. was, man, man, it was strange. It was it was it was weird. I, I literally was like, what the fuck is going on? Like, is he gonna do I not bring my phone because he can take all the information yeah. off and like he can it, it, like it was weird. See, talking to him, yeah, you could see he thinks a lot about how he can motivate and sort of get the most out of players. Like, he's big into that that sports psychology vibe. That's what the sort of vibe I was getting from him. Fascinating bloke. And yeah. I, fa- I found him I found him excellent in that space. Uh, yeah. he, some of his methods were very different, um, but they were all based around wanting to get to know the individual, to build, like, connections and bonds. Um to, to, to create a cult, you know, a good culture, you know, where you wanted to be a part of, of the of his team, of this Wallaby team, and I thought that, you know, I'd played for ten years, and prior to him becoming coach, times when I would go to Wallaby camp, it, you know, I preferred to be at, with the Reds because it, it just, I felt more of uh, a connection to to the Reds than I did when I would represent Australia. But when he came in, you know, he created this whole identity piece around, okay, what does it mean to represent this Wallaby team? What does it mean to be a part of this team? Like. Um, we're all different people that come from different cultures. What do we aspire to become? What do we aspire, where do we aspire to take the jersey to? And you sort of he put all that together to create this identity piece. And you know, for me, every time I then went back into Wallaby camp, I loved it because I knew what it meant to to be a part of this Wallaby team. And, and so I thought he was excellent. You know, some of the methods again were a bit different, but I thought he was excellent in creating you know, a, a good culture in that way. Just to back me, old mate, Renz up. He's the same though. He, like he'll be doing a similar thing to those boys in camp at the moment. He's a bloody good bloke, so uh, give him his chance. I've heard really good You're things right. about him. I've, I've, heard, I've, met, I've heard really good things about him. Like Quaid speaks very, very highly of him. Same thing around building like bonds and connections to, to for uh, and and the culture, but also he just he 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 says that Dave has an excellent rugby brain. Like he reckons he's an excellent, excellent coach. Yeah, and he's a good bloke off the field as well. Fucking legend. God, I love Dave Rennie. Miss you, Dave. <laughs> uh, well let's let's get a bit into your career now you started at the queensland reds under eddie jones it was a pr- pretty tough time for the club and eddie personally can you tell us your memories of how eddie handled that that year of disappointment I mean, Eddie probably described it perfectly in an, in, in an interview or his book or somewhere that I read. He, it seemed like he didn't care about the place. He was there <laughs> because, it, mate, he was, he, he was the most, most ruthless, most cutthroat person I've ever come across as a coach. And he would, like, he would, like, for us younger players, like, he took a particular liking to myself and Quaid. So, like, I, a lot of my footy career, I, I owe to Eddie Jones because of those early uh, habits and disciplines that he built into me. Um, but like some of the the way that he treated some of the players, like we had a guy named Oli Ave. He um he, we we we, st- we were starting preseason in 2006, and he stood him up in front of the team and said, "Look, mate, what were your skin folds, mate?" And he said something, and he goes, "Mate, take that shirt off and put the academy shirt on. You're training with academy for preseason. Get the fuck out." <laughs> and, and he ended up training doing preseason with the academy. Like so, we. Yeah. We had, and like myself and Quaid, because we were 18 years old, right? So we, we just started our professional footy careers. And so we were quiet. But he said to us one time after a couple of weeks, he said, look, you guys are nines and tens. You guys run the game and run the team. I need you to speak more. And it, until you start speaking more, you're going to do this thing called the, the non-talkers uh, group. So he, he, it was myself, him, and another young bloke. And he put us with three front rollers in a, like a 10 by 10 grid. And we did full contact for, for like five minutes after training. <sighs> Full, like 3v3 and so, just telling myself and then he goes, I'll get anyone talking <laughs> mate so he said until, until, until you blokes talk, start talking more um, you're, you're doing this and so it lasted about a week until we started being able to actually you know speak more so it was pretty funny but um, I, I treasure that experience that I had with him because like I said he while he was tough he actually taught me a lot about um, you know simple things like hard work doing the extras building habits and being disciplined around those habits and then um and seeing the correlation of that like transfer into good performances and and it, while he was really really hard on that um you know they, they certainly set me up for having a, the the career that i've had so far yeah i i really enjoyed my time with eddie at that in that season 
<laughs> well, you made your debut uh, against the All Blacks in 2009 for the Wallabies. When you think back to that day, what, what are the overriding highlights? Oh, man, that was... That, that, to the, that's, that was probably the most amazing experience, you know, that along with like playing my 100th test. I just, I, I, I'll never forget it. You know, I remember all the emotions on the bus ride sitting next to, to George Smith. Um, you know, listen, I was listening to like Land Down Under, I think, on my, on my iPod at the time, like on repeat and just thinking like, I, I, I remember thinking I'm sitting on a bus here like driving to the stadium about to play for Australia and it was just the most incredible emotion and feeling and you know, singing the anthem and things like that. And um, and against the All Blacks, you know, your first test facing the Haka. And it was funny, like I only got on for two minutes at the end, but then I remember when they when it was getting to like 78, 79th minute, I was like, please don't put me on, please don't put me on. I don't want to go on. I don't want to go on then. I don't want to go on. It's so true though, isn't it? It's so true. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. And then they call your number and you're like, ah, oh, damn it, I've got to go on. But then you go on there and you just go out there and do your job. And yeah, I think I passed the ball like three or four times and it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was such a such a cool experience, man. I'll never forget it. Isn't it funny? Like, I don't think people outside of the sport will understand, understand when you it, say yeah. that. When you say that, people will be like, "What the fuck is he on about? He doesn't want to get." <laughs> but it's a, on the bed. It's the weirdest feeling, isn't it? You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, the resistance. Yeah, I've, got go on. I've got to go on in a minute. Oh no! I think that's that's how it matters. Do you know what I mean? That's how you know it matters because you're like terrified. You know, you're that anxiety, that resistance before you have to perform. Like, that's how <laughs> man, you know. I, 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 Hundred percent. I think that's exactly it. Like it's it's, yeah. it's hard to explain, but I think that's the best way to think about it. It's like you 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 know you have to go out there and perform. It's going to be for your country, and you want to do <coughs> your best. But then it's like it's my first game, so I don't want to fuck up. And yeah, it's it's all those emotions. That's why I don't like some, see some of these young boys. Like I say, oh, like how are you feeling now? Like, no, all good. And I'm like, yeah, you're a bit nervous. No, 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 I'm not nervous. And I'm like, fucking what? Like, <laughs> I still I still get no. fucking nervous. I'm like, how are you no. not nervous? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think young kids these days are just a lot more confident than, than I think what we were. Like, I, I'm playing, playing the second division in Japan, I still get nervous, but only because I care. Like, I'm going to go out there and, and perform and do my job. And, yeah, I can't relate to the, the younger kids now playing because I'm like, shit, man, I still get nervous now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's what I think it is. I think when you're nervous, it's because you care and you, you think, fuck, I better do well here. Whereas, I don't know, I reckon they're all bullshit and just trying to bluff it. Yeah, trying to act all tough. <laughs> Well, later that year and in 2010, you were given one of the greatest honours a rugby player can receive when you were capped twice for the Barbarians. We heard it's it's as loose as loose can get. Can you shine a light on on how messy things were during those two matches? Mate, that, that, the best couple of weeks of footy you can play. And particularly like, like I remember in 2009, I, I got asked to go play. And around that, like, around that time, it was genuinely like they picked the best players that were available. Like that team, I think we had like um, we had Skulk Berger, Bucky's both uh, uh, Victor Matfield, Jacques Ferry, Habana on one wing, Rocket Oak on the other wing, Fred Dupree at halfback, um, and like I was on the bench. Um, and Matt Guido was playing ten at that time, and you just realise when you have that much quality in the team, you don't need to train <laughs> because we, we mate, we didn't train and we rocked up and beat the All Blacks, but I. Mate, every, every night we had dinners organised where we would go to the, the nicest of restaurants and then we'd go out to like a bar and a pub to get on the get on the drink. We'd all get back at like two or three in the morning. And then I remember we were on the bus to training on Monday. Everyone was hung over and it started to snow at that time, I think. And uh, I think Gitz got up and was like, boys, we're not training. We're, we're going back. We'll, we'll train tomorrow when, when the weather's better. And, <laughs> and I just went with, I was like, what, what is going on here? And then when we got that... We, when we got to training, I think it was A was off nine, B was off ten. That's it, boys. Let's just go out there and play footy. Um, <laughs> and like I said, you realise when you've got that much quality and talent in a team, you don't really need to do too much because we went out there and, yeah, mate, 2009, we beat the All Blacks. Um, and then 2010, the same thing. We, we had like Ma Anonu. We had Rokotoko again. We had uh, Rodney Soyalo. We had, oh, man, I can't even remember. But And we, we ended up beating the Springboks as well, so... But uh, you, you, it's like it's almost like you get mad Monday at the end of a season and you put it in over six days before a test match on Saturday. And, and that's essentially the best way to put it. Oh, good. <laughs> so good. Oh. It, 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 I mean, you were there. I think the, the infamous Andy Powell was there. Victor Matfield, very good value yeah. as well. I mean, who, 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 who's the, who is the best value? Oh, who was the best value? Andy Powell definitely was up there. I remember I was rooming with Jamie Roberts and I went out one time and came back. 
and there was a spew all over the toilet and the sink and on the floor. And I was like, I was like a 21 year old. And I think he was a senior player at the time. I was like, what do I say? Do I say anything or do I just pass it off like nothing happened and go to bed? And I just went to bed and the whole place stunk of like vomit. Um, but it, 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 it's hard to explain. Eh? Like we, like there were many instances like that, but it was essentially go dinner, go get on a piece, come home at three in the morning. And that was the whole time. And then turn up and, and, and play footy. And, yeah, I mean, it, it was loose. Goodness me, you're bringing back some memories. I remember, I remember, I remember going to do like gym one time, and like I think it was on a Tuesday, and Havana, like what was walked past me in the gym, and then for the remainder of the week, like they kept taking the piss out of me, saying, "Oh, look at this bloke. What are you doing gym for? Like he, he should be out here with us getting on the piss, and you're doing gym. What's wrong with you? It's a barbar's week." <laughs> yeah, to be fair, the, the week I tried to do it, I, <coughs> the only reason I went to the gym was sit in a sauna and try and sweat out the piss. Uh, mate, they're the best weeks, honestly, because you you get to like mix and mingle with people for, that you're always competing against, and 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 you do it in just a social setting and a social environment, and it's all sort of you know put, like held together by the game, by footy, you know, the, eventually playing on Saturday, and it's just so enjoyable. Like it, it's probably two of the most enjoyable weeks I've had playing footy. Oh, how good! You've mentioned the Lions coming to Australia in 2013, and 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 actually it being one of the biggest regrets of your career. You personally, the team played very dominantly at, at, at times. Do you regret how easily you let the series slip away in that third test? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we, we got, I mean, we got dominated in that third test. I remember kickoff in the third test, I dropped the ball uh, and off that scrum, they score. And it, little things just deteriorated us from that moment on because I went, uh, I was standing under the ball uh, and I thought our second role had called to catch it. And then I, at the last minute, he pulls away and I go to catch it and knock it on. And Lucky it's just... Forwards. <laughs> yeah, I'll blame him forever. But um, yeah, it's just... And then from there, they just... They, they seized the momentum and carried it right throughout the game. And yeah, look, we... Because I look back, that first test we lost, Kurtley missed that kick right on full, full time, right in front 40 metres out. You know, he probably nails that nine times out of 10, but he slips. And then we go and win in Melbourne. And then yeah, we get we get destroyed in that third test. I just I just look back and think that there were so many things, little things that if they happened or went our way, it might have changed the result. Um, and and also, mate, just the prestige of it. Like it's the the British and Irish Lions. You know, it's it's you know outside of a World Cup, it's probably the biggest thing that you can be a part of. And to have let that opportunity slip, um, yeah, it sort of still sits with me in a negative way. Well, we won't we won't overhash it for you, but whilst we're on slightly uh, downer moments, this isn't a downer moment. Obviously, 2012, you were asked to captain your country um, as as you had done previously as well. But you were injured in the first half of a championship match against the Springboks. I've rewatched it. You, you, the match has gone down, not really in folklore, but the the, the post match interview for you. Tell us what happened from your point of view. <laughs> So I've, I've done my ACL and I've just been told I've done my ACL because I was the captain of that game. I got interviewed after the test match. And uh, Rod Caper comes up to me and says something along the lines of, um, you know, you didn't do that well or something like that. And I thought he was having a personal dig at me saying I didn't play very well. And so I fired back at him saying, well, you don't think I played well. And then I think he said something along the lines of, oh, it was the team that I was referring to, blah, blah, blah. And I just... It's it's embarrassing, but also really funny. But I've not brought myself to be able to watch it again because I would cry. I would it'd be way too cringy, way too uncomfortable <laughs> for me. So I, I don't think I could do it. Yeah, because I cops. Everyone thought it was funny. Like everyone was like, "It's funny," and then you know, some people thought it was rude or disrespectful or whatever. But I sort of blame it on the fact that I knew I was about to miss twelve months of footy with an ACL. So that's that's my excuse. Yeah, head head was gone. Yeah, that's absolutely loud. Yeah. Head loss. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. well, to to, to be yeah. honest, mate, if, if you ever, I, I I watched it last night. Just so you know, all the comments are actually really good about you because at, at the end, you come, you just right at the end, you row back and go. By the way, mate, sorry, got I think I got the wrong end of the stick. Apologies, and everyone's like, ah, oh, what a legend, what a legend. So don't, <laughs> no need to cringe. See, I, mate, I, I didn't even know about that. I forgot about that, so I feel better about it now. I might go watch it. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, the comment, the comment section can be the best thing on earth, like, yeah, actually, and the worst, and yeah, the very much worst. the worst. Yeah, I but love even, the comment section. 
even when it's at its worst, it still makes me laugh. It's like hilarious. Yeah. Some of the comments, you're like, shut up, you idiots. I went through a phase of like wanting to read people's comments for a while because I I used to use it as motivation because like there was, I, I mean, we all go through it. Right? Like I had a down period in my test career where people were like, oh, you, you're too slow, blah, 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 this, all this sort of type of stuff. And then I like, I, I, I would read the comments and it would sort of, this like make you feel like uncomfortable or sad or whatever it is and, and whatnot. But then like I sort of flipped this switch. I was like, no, I'm going to read every single comment. I'm going to use it as motivation and try and prove these people wrong. And for a while it worked, but then you start to realize, man, you're just giving all these people power over your emotions, <laughs> giving them all this energy. Like what, what the fuck do they know? Like, you know, so just let it go. That was a good, that was a good learning curve for me around the whole comment situation on YouTube and social media and all those things. Yeah. 100% roles last few minutes i know um max you've got to you've got to go and do some training and uh, let's let's uh, finish up quickly all three of you fellas uh, let's start with our superstar will who's going to win the world cup next year man i'm, I'm gonna say france I, I i just think they've got such high quality players i love their forward pack and they've got momentum and consistency going into the world cup i'm with you I was going to say it, France, it, and they're on their own soil. I'm, I'm with you. I think France, Max, you were going to say England, not you. I was like, shit. <laughs> you idiot. You idiot. You think you're going to win? Idiot. Um, should we go for the, the, like, the, 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 the classic? The classic early Peakers Island. I might, I might go with them. Oh, um, yeah, I'm going that. with them. I'm going with them. As long as I just want Sexton to go out. Of, no, you hate Sexton, don't you? You're right. Well, I don't hate him. Stop like frying <laughs> shit because I'll get spicy. It. Spicy he, mid He part. hates you. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> hates me. Yeah, he no, hates no. me. I'm going to go with the, the Emerald Nation. There you are. Well, have you come across Johnny Sexton a few times in your career? I have actually, yeah. He's, uh, he, he's an odd dude on the field only because he's always like angry. He just always looks so angry, like whether it's at the ref or his teammates and things like that. Um... Quite an intense character, yeah, but world class. Like, what, what, a, what a player! Like, he, he's been so good for so long. People have always, you know, have been writing him off lately, saying he's too old, and he just orchestrated a series win against the All Blacks. So, what a player! Yeah, you fuckers need to stop throwing him under the bus. Like, he, nah, I love it. he doesn't love like it. me. I'm all right. Me and Sex are like that. Down to the bus, right? So it's, the oh, it's the Monster Boys. It's the Monster Boys. Boys. It's not. It's not all the Leinster Boys. Yeah, Willie Gagne. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Uh, Mark, Rye, ta ta for now. I've got to go. I've got to go to training. Hey, bro. Absolute pleasure, sir. Bye. We will finish off. We've got some quick fire, but a quick thought on Ryan's pal, Nick White, who is the Aussie equivalent of that intensity when he goes on the field, but is very different off it. Oh, mate, Whitey cracks me up. Like, Whitey wants to fight everyone. Like, he, 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 and he's like, if something happens and the play's still going on, he's like running to the ruck and like having an argument with the ref or the touchy and still like manages to get the pass away or get the kick away. And I'm like, how do you have so that much energy to be able to do that? I remember when I was playing, like I was puffed just trying to find a run to the breakdown, but he's, he can have a conversation, have an argument and still like execute the skill. And I'm like, bro, save your energy. Just relax. I bloody love that bloke. I caught him after the game. And I also spoke to Jack Dempsey after the game. Obviously he was... Uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> I said, "Do you get any shit off the boys?" He said, "Ah, oh, just Whitey." <laughs> I love Whitey. I mean, I, I, I genuinely, he's a good man. He's a good, re- really good man. Good, like, an, like take footy aside of, he's a, he's a really good dude, and I really enjoy his company. He's a top quality, top quality bloke. Right. Well, just finish off. We're going to do our quick fire round. Uh, we do it to everyone. It's you know, first thing that comes into your head. Best player you've ever played against, Richie McCall. Best player you've ever played with? Quade Cooper. Loosest teammate you've ever played with? <laughs> um, Rod Davies, without a doubt. The, the king of getting nude. Oh, we love that. We love a naked skydive on a bus. <laughs> uh, biggest fight you've ever witnessed in training? Scott Higginbotham absolutely dropped Adam Burns from more training because... and. and the funniest part about it is as backs, we were doing a video session, which you do while forwards are doing more training down the bottom of the field. And so we had just finished and we just would, we decided to stand up and watch what they were doing. 
And as soon as we all stood up to watch it, Higgins has just unloaded six uppercuts and, and Burns has just <laughs> dropped. Burns has just dropped. And we're like, yep, that's why we're backs, boys. That's why we're backs. I love it. I love it when the batters come on here and confirm what I say every week. I'm, fucking, I'm always on here slagging them off, so now they're playing kick tennis whilst we're punching the lights out of each other. You're not lying. Like, we generally have had unit sessions, back sessions, where we played kick tennis. And the argument is, well, you, you need to practice kicking to the corners and you kick kicking accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> With a football. Fuck, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Person in rugby who would be your best mate if you knew them? I would have loved to have had a beer with Jonah Lomu. I was going to say exactly the same. That's exactly yeah. what I was just thinking in my head. Yeah. Just, just because he would have been a good man to have a yarn to about life and rugby and everything. He would have been a great man to have a beer with. And I was doing some stuff at the weekend and Andrew Mertens was there and he was telling some fucking funny stories about him. Apparently, like, John Lowe was like a one-up as well. He was just like, he would just, his stories would just grow and grow and grow and he would like, they would be the most ridiculous stories ever. And But then people would back it up and he'd be like, oh shit, they are true. So yeah, yeah they are true. One. Mertz is a good man. He would have been a good man to get on the drink with. I haven't had a drink with him, but he, he's he's got a lot of good stories and he's, he's, he's a good man to be around. Three players with you in a cab for the ultimate piss up. Oh, Rod Davies, um, Diwani, and I'm going to go Andy Powell. He's loose, and he's always up for a good time. Worst enemy in rugby? The All Blacks. They beat me way too many times. <laughs> that's nice. A lot of people say oh, I haven't got one, but uh, that's a good one. Um, I will also say so. Just just on that last one, I will I will say Mike Phillips as well. Oh yeah, weird. yeah. He had he had this weird thing where he'd always come after me whenever we played them. I remember, like he'd always be mouthing off at me. Or and like he, from all I've never met him, but from all reports, he's a great bloke. But on the field, he would like come after me and like hit me late. And like I remember one time he had me at, a, at the bottom of a ruck and was elbow putting his elbow on the side of my head, and I just I was like, "You're way too big and strong, man. There's nothing I can do." So I'm just gonna cop it. He's also he's also got this like weird arrogance thing, which is quite funny if you know who he is, like you speak to him, but he's like he plays up on it as well. He's like, you know, I'm probably one of the best nines in the world. And like if you, yeah. you know, he's like that, but you gotta understand his crack because if you take it wrong, you're like, fuck, he's arrogant. Yeah, I remember some of the boys, I think Gitz or Gitz and Drew, I think, were telling me about him, and they said he's actually a good bloke and he, he like he he plays up to this character and he's just he's actually just a funny dude and he, he has fun with it. So I was like, yeah, I mean, like I said, there was nothing I could have done about it anyway. He's about six foot three or something and like a hundred <laughs> yeah. kilos. So. Well, but on the field, yeah, there you are. <laughs> uh, well, sadly, that is all the time we've got left for this week. A huge thank you uh, to Will. You've been fantastic uh, hearing all about your career and your thoughts on Aussie rugby as well. Uh, thanks to Ryan and thanks to Max. And we'll see you all next week. Yeah, what was that?